Our uh, opening thought is coming from Marjorie Harris from uh, In the Garden. This planet is an exquisitely arranged and interconnected system. What's controlled in one place is going to have consequences in another place. Our job as gardeners is to try and figure this out no matter how small our allotted space might be. Discipline has to be the watchword for our controlling hands. It means not gardening without thinking of the garden as a habitat for mice, for squirrels, for bees and wasps, for other living creatures beyond ourselves. Our next reading comes from John Dido Lurie, Three Gates of Zen. Alfred North Whitehead once pointed out that when we really understand the biological and physiological functioning of the human body and the behavior of the molecules which constitute it, it becomes impossible to entertain the notion of a discontinuity between the body and its external environment. Living on this mountain, I can't help but realize that my body is completely integrated with the body of the mountain. Every time I drink the water that spills out of it into the mountain stream, the cells of my body assimilate it. My body is now largely composed of the water that comes from this mountain. We grow our food in the mountain soil. The plants start out as a single seed and by taking water, light, and minerals from the mountain, eventually manifest themselves as fruits, vegetables, flowers. Thus, we take the mountain into our very being. We consume it. Our septic system even returns our waste to the mountain. How could we feel separate from it? Our next reading is from Reverend Forrest Gilmore, and it's a reflection on the seventh principle, which can be found in the seven principles in word and worship, edited by Ellen Brandenburg. Our seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence, is a glorious statement. Yet we make a profound mistake when we limit it to merely an environmental idea. It is so much more. It is our response to the great dangers of both individualism and oppression. It is our solution to the seeming conflict between the individual and the group. Our seventh principle may be our uni Unitarian Universalist way of coming to fully embrace something greater than ourselves, the interdependent web, expressed as the spirit of life, the ground of all being, the oneness of all existence, the community forming power, the process of life, the creative force, even God, can help us develop that social understanding of ourselves that we and our culture so desperately need. It is a source of meaning to which we can dedicate our lives. But we'll do the discourse now, which is on the seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence, of which we are a part. The seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism affirms the truth that we as persons are part of a larger community, the larger human community and the larger ecological community of all life. It also affirms that our flourishing as humans is dependent on the flourishing of the entire biotic community. To dig into the insights of the seventh principle, I'm going to share today a little bit with you about two of my mentors from my graduate school days, but they were mentors for me beyond my graduate school days as well. 
And I want to share about them because I think that they exemplified adherence to the seventh principle in both thought and in their actions. The two persons that I'm going to talk about some today are Walter Mulder and Harry Oliver. I would never call Harry Oliver Harry Oliver when I was a student. It was always Dr. Oliver, and I would never call Walter Mulder Walter. I'd call him Dean Mulder because he had been dean of the Boston University School of Theology for many years. But as time went by, I did get to call them Walter and Harry and get to know them uh, as friends and not just as professors. We have a strong tendency within our society to have an overly individualistic understanding of who we are as persons, especially here in the United States. We're kind of the bastion of individualism here in the United States. We tend to focus a great deal on individual accomplishments and individual successes, and we often lift up as heroes or exemplars those individuals who have risen to the top in wealth and power and who have in some ways transcended the limits and boundaries of their communities. The seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism, however, affirms what I have often referred to with you as eco-communitarian personalism, in which human persons are seen as persons in community rather than simply products of rugged individualism. The seventh principle provides an important corrective on that rugged individualism of our society. Who and what we are is shaped by our relationships that we have within community and by the values that we share with each other in community. And our community is more than just a human community. We are also part of that larger community of nature. In my tradition, the United Methodist Church, we call it the community of all creation. Some others would call it simply the ecological community. And we are part of that community in such a way that we are persons in ecological community with responsibility, moral responsibility, because we as human persons within the community of all life, we seem to be the only ones here on earth, at least, who are moral agents and who have moral responsibility and accountability. And the responsibility that we have is for the health and well-being and the flourishing of each other and all life. One of my beloved mentors mentors at uh, Boston University during my doctoral studies was Walter Mulder. He was a social ethicist, a Christian social ethicist. He was dean of the Boston University School of Theology for many years. He was a mentor uh, to Martin Luther King Jr. as well. And I was really lucky to have the very last two classes that Walter Mulder ever taught. He taught as an adjunct after he retired for free because he simply wanted to teach uh, and be with students. And so I had the very last two classes that he taught. And looking back uh, at his teachings, his writings, and his activism, I see the seventh principle expressed clearly and compellingly in his views. Mulder emphasized the communitarian nature of the person. He put it like this in kind of philosophical words. He described the person as a socius, S-O-C-I-U-S, a socius with a private center, affirming both the person's relations to the community with the socius and the integrity of the person's individual experience with the private center. The person in community does not exist outside of relations with the community. 
take the community away and the person will quickly cease to exist. The person and community does not exist outside of the relations with the community, but the person is also not simply the sum of his or her relations. Holes, he said, that's W-H-O-L-E-S, holes have qualities which the parts or the components do not have. Mulder also recognized the reality and value of non-human experience. This may seem commonsensical to us, <laughs> but a lot of philosophers in the Western tradition have not recognized the value of non-human experience. But his doing so allowed him to expand his notion of community to include all of life. Thus, his position is a clear example of an eco-communitarian personalism that affirms the person in ecological community. Mulder's view of our intimate connection with nature and his view that non-human beings are also centers of value activity led him to adopt Albert Schweitzer's position that human persons should practice a reverence for life, a reverence for life. I got to know Walter Mulder pretty well and so well that I learned a number of things about him. He was so focused on personal relations within his community that as he was getting older and it was becoming common for everybody to have their ATM bank cards and would draw money from the ATM machines, Walter Mulder refused to get an ATM card because he wanted to continue the personal relationships that he had with the bank tellers and also the other customers in the bank. He said, I feel like I'm gonna lose that if I get a bank card and start using it and going to the automatic teller machine. I want to talk with people. I want to have personal relationships. He wanted to preserve those aspect, aspects of our community that were personalizing and to avoid all the things that we have in our community that are depersonalizing, that are dehumanizing. It's also important to note that Mulder's perspective and his communitarian personalism influenced Martin Luther King Jr.'s worldview to a great extent. It also helped to provide a philosophical grounding for the great civil rights movements of the past century. And now, the eco-communitarian version of personalism is providing a compelling philosophical grounding for thought and action in this, our make or break century, to make sure that we preserve and sustain our ecological community. Because the only sustainable way forward for us is to live as responsible persons within the community of all life. Without a diverse and healthy ecological community, human communities will not be possible. The dominant view of the self, which is connected to this communitarian personalism, the dominant view of the self in Western culture has been the opposite of communitarianism. The dominant view in Western culture has been that the human person is separated from the natural world, and to a certain extent, separated from other human persons. You may have heard of Rene Descartes. You know you've made it in philosophy when a whole school of thought has been named after you, after you in his case, Cart Cartesian school of thought or Cartesianism. The Cartesian view of the person is that the mind is separated from the body and that value comes primarily from our ability to reason. This has been the dominant view in Western philosophy. Value comes from humans' ability to reason, our rational capability. Rene Descartes also said that the self is a mental substance. The self is a mental substance Whereas the rest of the world, and that includes our bodies, because our bodies really are not ourselves, according to Descartes, believe it or not, 
The rest of the world, including our bodies, are simply physical substances, just matter, just bits of matter, stuff, things, objects, not subjects. Typically, mental substance or mind is given the status of possessing intrinsic value, value for its own sake. Sometimes we might call this inherent worth. Whereas matter or body or the material world, including animals, all those are just simply given the status of possessing instrumental value. In other words, the material world is viewed as mere stuff, the value of which is only related to how it may be used by rational human beings. The consumption and use of the material world without regard for how our human actions affect it is justified by a worldview that sees the world as simply providing instrumental value for us. Such an understanding of the self and such an attitude concerning the natural world have fueled an economic culture that sees nature more as a commodity, more as a commodity rather than as a world of experience and beauty that is worthy of respect and possessing its own worth and dignity. The dominant individualistic understanding of the self has focused on using and consuming nature and treating nature simply as a commodity rather than as a community. And it's consequently destroying nature. It's, it's destroying the fabric of the ecological community. The fierce urgency of now calls for us to break away from this individualistic vision. It calls for us to embrace a communitarian and a relational understanding of the self. A philosophical vision of this relational self can be found in the thought of the second mentor of mine that I want to talk to you about today, Harold Oliver. Harry lived from 1930 to 2011. He was not only a beloved mentor of mine at Boston University, he was one of the most kind persons I've ever met in my life. And simultaneously, he's one of the smartest persons I've ever met in my life. Coming originally out of the Southern Baptist tradition, he was trained as a New Testament scholar. And before coming to Boston University, where he was teaching when I was in graduate school, before coming to Boston University, he taught New Testament at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in North Carolina. But he started dabbling in the theology of the New Testament scholar, Rudolf Bultmann, and thus came to reject literalistic interpretations of Scripture. That was too much for the Southern Baptists, and Oliver was fired from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary actually made kind of national news at the time, uh, was discussed uh, in the academy quite a bit. By the time I met Harold Oliver during my doctoral studies at Boston University from 1992 to 1996, he had been working in the area of philosophical theology for many years. When he came to Boston University after he had been fired, he told the dean of Boston University School of Theology, guess who that was? Walter Mulder. He said, I want to move away from New Testament and focus more on philosophical theology. And Walter Mulder gave him that flexibility to do that. Not only had he been working in the area of philosophical theology for many years, and this is where the intellect, uh, the smarts really come in for him, he took a sabbatical to study cosmology and theoretical astronomy at Cambridge University under somebody named Boyle. I think people might know who that is. <laughs> In fact, he was made a member of the uh, Royal Theor Theoretical Astronomy Society 
uh, as well during that time. He also spent a number of years studying Japanese Buddhism. So pretty significant transition here, right? He'd been a New Testament professor in a Southern Baptist seminary with a fairly literalistic view of scripture, moved from that into philosophical theology, into cosmology, into theoretical astronomy, into Japanese Buddhism. And then also, this was one of the really interesting things about Harold Oliver. He would do complex calculus problems simply to keep his mind sharp. And I think for fun. <laughs> And all of that really is just the tip of the iceberg in relation to his intellectual prowess. Oliver's view, though, of the relational self, I think, is so closely aligned with the seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism. His relational self rejects all idealistic and materialistic conceptions of the person. We're not simply a ghost in the machine, the kind of... Cartesian way of looking at things. We're not simply our bodies. We're not simply physical substance. So he rejects the idealistic and the materialistic conceptions of the person, and he rejects the notion of the self as a substance. He argues, rather, that the adjective relational, the adjective relational assigns to the notion of person the only justifiable content it may have. Who we are as persons is primarily connected to our relations, our relational aspect of who we are in relation to others. Oliver notes that a relational view of the person is actually commensurate with notions of, of the selfhood in cultures where the privatized Western notion of the self has not been determinative. And that's why he was drawn to Buddhism. He was drawn to the Kyoto school specifically of Japanese, Japanese Buddhism. Who we are is not simply the physical stuff we are made of. It's not simply this mental ghost in the machine. Rather, who we are is ultimately our relations. The value of our life is ultimately connected to our relations. Oliver's rejection of a substantial self enables him to deny any material or idealistic barriers between human persons and the rest of the world, kind of like the mountain reading that we were hearing earlier. If relations provide the only justifiable content to the notion of personhood, there is nothing that separates human persons from the world around us. Here we see a complete and utter rejection of Cartesian dualism and its affirmation of mental and physical substance and its mind-body dualism. For Oliver, it is just as true to say that the world is in persons as it is to say that persons are in the world. All is relating. All is relating. Consequently, the value of our persons is directly related to the value of our relations with the world around us. For we participate fully in the world as it participates fully in us. And such an awareness of our relations with the world provides a more appropriate grounding for ecologically responsible action. The relational self provides a model for self-understanding that values relationships, relationships with each other, relations with all of life, rather than simply seeing nature as stuff that we are to use and consume. Relational selves find their meaning and their value through community, rather than through an individualistic and consumeristic culture. The relational self understands that the value of relations will always be greater and more meaningful than the values of consumption and the kind of economic activity that diminishes the quality of relations. The relational self provides hope for this our make or break century. We lost the physical presence of Walter Mulder in 2004. He was in his upper 90s. And Harold Oliver passed away in 2011. 
But I'm thankful for the many ways that they both exemplified the wisdom of the seventh principle through their remarkable intellect and scholarship, but more importantly, through the way that they related to other persons. I'm thankful for the many ways that they showed respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are all a part. And given that we are really our relations, not some physical body or some mental substance, given that who we really are is our relations with each other in community, I feel that in this interdependent web of all existence, both Harry Oliver and Walter Mueller continue to relate to us and to me through the wisdom and good actions of their lives. Our parting thought comes from Sunita Rai, Mindfulness for the Family. With wisdom, we do not see ourselves as a master or ruler of the world in any way. Rather, we see ourselves as part of the world, an interconnected and interdependent systemic whole.